Hi, welcome to another episode of Talking with Docs. I'm Dr. Brad Weening. And I'm Dr. Paul Zalzal. And on today's episode, we are still in isolation, so we're doing this together, but not really together. And we're going to talk a little bit about anti-inflammatories and coronavirus, because there's been a lot of stuff in the media recently. Um, but before that, Paul, why don't we talk a little bit about some things we've noticed while in isolation. One interesting observation I've noticed is the way policies are changing, okay, and in, in this province they're doing the Quarantine Act is, become, is going to become uh, a thing again, and, um, you know, I've noticed that if you, if now, all of a sudden, if you saw like three university students playing basketball at the school, they would get publicly shamed, maybe arrested, maybe in some trouble, yes. however, if those same university students stayed home and smoked marijuana, that is now an essential service. So I think it's funny the way that's changed over the last, uh, you know, year, that I is, thought. I mean... That is interesting. Very interesting I mean, observation. Yeah, like... For sure. It's ironic. Um, what about you? So the first thing for me is I've noticed that facts are optional when it comes to reporting things on the internet. Uh, and, that's a good one. <laughs> right? I'm like... I read something like, yes. wow, how can someone say that? And then I read 10 other articles that blatantly refute whatever that other person said. And there's no kind of backlash. There's no accountability. And I think it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit dangerous. I saw a stand-up yeah. comedian the other day who talked about the internet almost like smoking when you're pregnant. How before you used to do it and now, you know, now you can't. And people are going to look back and say, well, man, the internet, people used to just go on there and just look at things. And, you know, and I thought it was a very interesting uh, way to look at the internet, which is very dangerous, I think, yeah. potentially. Totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. That's a good one. Yeah. Okay. My, uh, my second observation is uh, that um, I saw in the news that they're try you know, one of the latest treatments is passive immunity where okay. they're going to take the serum, the blood of someone who's been infected with COVID-19 and uh, administer it to someone who's been infected because that person who was infected has the antibodies that can fight the virus. So just they're like, giving the, just like in the movie outbreak. A, yeah. Yeah. Pass. Yeah, exactly. Passive immunity. They're talking about this new treatment that we're going to try and yes. it has some hope that technique was developed in the late 1800s. Yeah. So our biggest hope right now is some medical technology that's over 120 years old. Yeah. That's not extremely reassuring, but it does work. And similarly, our, the other, our other defense so that society isn't wiped out is, um, is isolation. Just trying to isolate ourselves and keep away from people who have it. That medical technology dates back to biblical times the way we treated lepers. Lepers, yes, so, absolutely. Send them to the outskirts of town. Yeah, so... Or even when we had two, those TB, places for TB, like the, the sanatoriums yeah. for TB. Put all the people with TB in the same building. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's right. So our two biggest defenses right now are either over 100 years old or over thousands of years old. But you know what? They seem to work. So I guess if something works, then you stick with it. Yeah, I was thinking about that when I was using my cotton gin and my butter churn earlier today. <laughs> That's right. Well, I was going to say we'd be doing this video via telegraph. That's right. Just in. That'd be super slow. Dr. Weeding is, I'm doing very well, full stop. That's right. I am self-isolating, full stop. Yeah. So, yeah, our technology right now, we're relying on some really old technology, but it seems to be working. Old school is new school. That's right. What about you? Give okay, me your... Okay, my, uh, my second one is that I've realized if I had more time, I would be a very dangerous online shopper, I think. Um... <laughs> Two days ago, I bought an umbrella that changes color when it rains. <laughs> That's a, just in case you can't tell. I, no, just it's cool. So when you're out walking oh, with it, oh, like it changes like oh. those little butterflies and flowers that change as it rains. Um, oh, I thought it's because like, you're out there and it's raining. So, like, is it raining? Oh yeah, my umbrella is purple. And I also That's bought. Brilliant. I also bought a home co composting unit. I thought in these times of stress, I thought we need to be more independent, live off the land more more kind of little house on the prairie. So I bought a home comp compost unit that I'm going to set up once it's not like minus three at night here. I love it. Yeah, I absolutely love it. Um, yes. Amazon I'm going to stay off the, <laughs> I'm going to stay off the home shopping channel. Bad okay. Idea. So my third interesting observation is, um, facial hair. Hmm. I was, uh, 
watching uh, the news about talking about um, the masks, different masks that are out there, and the microbiologist that was uh, discussing the mask and the N95 mask. Uh, just as an aside, the N95 mask is the mask that prevents 95% of the pathogens, I guess, from, from getting through. If anyone's wondering what N95 means, that's the sort of measure of how well it filters, right? For example, doing nothing is an N0. You saran need to wrap make the N100, face. though, really. You need the N100. That's, the N100 is saran wrap over your face. I don't <laughs> recommend it. It has inherent problems, but that would be an N100. Yes. Uh, don't do that. But this microbiologist had a big honking grizzly Adam's beard and I'm thinking the N95 isn't gonna work with that facial hair you're not gonna get a seal around your face N75, right? N65 you're gonna be yeah you're pushing N20 at best with that thing especially if you got a bit of food in there it's game over so the uh, the, uh, the CDC has put out recommendations on what type of facial hair is okay with an N95 mask and if you're if you're thinking of growing a beard you should check that out. And furthermore, I don't want to name any names or point any fingers or speak in any specifics, but the leader of our country has a very handsome goatee happening. It's, yes. it's probably not a good idea for him to support that because if anyone needs to be saved, it's the prime minister. I'm not naming any names, but if he needs to wear an N95, it's not going to work. And I just read today that Jim Carrey is going to grow a beard until everyone is back to work. That's not going to work either if he, if, he needs a, if he needs an N95, though I do appreciate the uh, borrowing it from the playoffs uh, move, but yeah. So facial hair and N95 mask is a funny okay. little observation I've made. I like it. Um, my third is that I've noticed how my body no longer responds to exercise like it did 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I feel How like so? I, so in two ways. One, I get like 10 times more pain and I get 10% right. of the benefit. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's very, it's sad. Gravity is a cruel, cruel thing to our bodies as we age. I'm pro knocking on 50 this coming summer. So, uh, um, yeah, you don't look it. You no, look good. Thanks, buddy. Thanks. Okay, so should we move on to uh, more related to COVID-19 topics like anti-inflammatory? Absolutely. Let's okay. hear it. So in the media recently, there's been a lot of talk about whether or not things like Advil, Leave, Ibuprofen, that class of drugs, anti-inflammatories and even cortisone, whether or not they are safe or even potentially dangerous in the setting of COVID-19. A uh, little background where this came from is that there's some anecdotal reports from, from China during their first initial exposure back in December and January, as well as some French anecdotal reports about maybe saying we shouldn't be using ibuprofen uh, to deal with the symptoms of COVID-19. Is that what you heard, Paul? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great topic. And you know what, it's a bit outside our area of specialty. However, we do prescribe a lot of anti-inflammatories yes. when we're dealing with musculoskeletal conditions and I did see that those same reports and when I first saw them I was driving into work at, before and I was all of a sudden thinking hey uh, I better tell my patients not to come in for cortisone injections and uh, not to take anti-inflammatories when I first heard it before I had really looked into it uh, right. too much so what's your take so I so not based on things that I specifically have discovered but reading other intelligent people have said Theoretically, that's possible, but there is certainly no conclusive scientific evidence that that's true. So anecdotal right. reports alone, you can't kind of make sweeping generalizations about that. So one epidemiologist from UBC or the University of British Columbia here in Canada said, we can't make decisions based like that. So in general, the purpose of anti-inflammatories as well as a Tylenol or acetaminophen-based products during something like this viral outbreak is to improve the symptoms. In the first case, it doesn't change the duration of the disease. It doesn't change the outcome of the disease. It just alters the symptoms. So first line should be acetaminophen. And then if you had a fever that potentially was like refractory, you could add um, ibuprofen potentially to reduce that fever as long as it went along with the other medication, things like that. But they said, hey, we can't make a, a world recommendation against uh, anti-inflammatories. And the WHO supported that as well. Yeah, and that's the tricky thing about this is, is a lot of decisions are being made yes. without uh, evidence because the evidence just isn't there yet. Uh, but a lot of decisions have to be made. So, uh, yeah, that's a good one. And I must say, over the last week or two, I've told a lot of patients not to use anti-inflammatories right. based on that anecdotal evidence. And after looking into it more thoroughly, uh, really, there's no there's no good evidence to support 
not using it. So it is confusing. Personally, would you take an Advil right now if you got if you had a cold? I probably would, to be honest. You would, eh? Yeah, I'd take Advil. Yeah. First I'd take Tylenol if it didn't work, then I'd add Advil. Yeah, so ibuprofen, we shouldn't be yeah. using trade names, but yeah, yeah, ibuprofen. I think, personally, I'm the same, I would, well, anti-inflammatories at the best of times upset my stomach, so I yeah. wouldn't really take it, but if a family member was asking me, or one of my patients was asking me, I would say, yeah, definitely try acetaminophen first, and then if it becomes a risk balance thing, if you're getting into a high fever situation, which, and we really need to control that fever, and, we, and we're thinking of adding ibuprofen at that point, I would say, yeah, you know, that seems to be the less risky thing to do. Agreed. What about cortisone? Cortisone now, injecting cortisone in knees. So, so same thing, to be honest with you. There's no or evidence to say shoulders. that it's, that I think it carries some general risks without a pandemic. So I think you probably proceed with caution. If it's not urgent, you probably could delay it. But I, I don't know that, like, you're not injecting cortisone into a guy in the ICU that has COVID-19, right? So I right. don't know that it's going to make someone that, if they already have symptoms, I think in general, you probably should be careful. If, if you right. don't, then you have to make that decision based on how urgent it is. So I'm not, I'm not super concerned about that part. But I'm not rushing out to give everybody cortisone that normally got it on a regular basis. Like we had talked about before, we might stretch it out a bit and just see where, see where things are going to go in the next little while. Yeah, so cortisone is a steroid. It can suppress your immune system, but when we inject it locally into a shoulder, an elbow, a knee, uh, it, most of it stays local. But there is some systemic absorption. Yeah. It does get into the bloodstream a bit. We do see evidence of that. Uh, so the question is: Is that putting someone at more risk if they do get COVID? And again, like you said, no good evidence to support it. Balance the risk. If someone is so severely debilitated now that it becomes an urgent treatment. Uh, for them as you know we've had to cancel elective surgery so now if this is something you can offer someone should yeah. we be doing it should we not we don't have the right answer and sort of we make the decision on a case-by-case -case basis I guess yeah actually and that's a good little note um, it's March 25th and just for all of our patients that are actually subscribers and watchers surgery is currently canceled until April 6th and that's uh, something that's being ongoing assessed so we're gonna let our patients know as soon as we know yeah, we just, every, things change day by day and we're waiting to hear from our hospital. So yeah, we apologize for that inconvenience uh, and we appreciate your understanding that elective surgeries just can't And there were right now. Actually, there were tons of comments about this. People saying, oh, I'm supposed to have this, supposed to have this, I'm canceled. Most people obviously are understanding and some people relieved almost because they didn't want to end up in the hospital in an uncertain yeah. kind of situation. So yeah, the next, yeah. the next little while, I think it's going to determine a lot of what's going to happen going forward. So we'll just, yeah, wait and see. Everyone try to stay safe, do your best. That kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And thanks for all your understanding. Again, I'm yes. doing all my consults virtually and I'm phoning my patients. And they're really super understanding about the fact that we can't meet face to face. And uh, I, think, I think, you know what, I'd like to kind of commend uh, my community. And what I'm seeing, people are doing a really great job trying to adhere to the recommendations uh, that have been put forth, which are very difficult. Staying home, yes. social distancing, physical distancing is not easy. I think, you know, People out there, you're doing an awesome job, and uh, I think we're going to see good results from that soon. Agree, yeah. Fingers crossed it goes quickly that we all just kind of hunker down and do what we're told. And yeah, like you and I have talked about too, not everyone agrees with the strategy, but I think we have to trust in the government that we've elected. And if we all do what's prescribed, then hopefully that at least a good outcome for everybody. It's not just about an individual. Like if you go outside, yeah, you might not get it, but you can give it to somebody else and the domino effect and all the rest of it. So. Yeah, we just have to kind of listen to our leaders and trust them and go from there. Yeah, agreed, totally. Okay, well, thanks so for calling me today. Hey, uh, yeah, I know, I miss you, man, I miss you. Yeah. Um, so if, if you guys like this video, please like it, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment down below. And, and uh, we're working hard to answer these comments uh, very regularly, and we have a little bit more time, so we're probably uh, more on top of that than normal. So, um, yeah, thanks yeah, for Yeah, please leave, you, leave your comments. We, we Let appreciate us know what you're the interaction. About, what you're doing. Yeah, and, and some ideas about future videos. Yeah, absolutely. All right, and remember, you are in charge of your own health. We'll see you next time, and hopefully soon.